So the sermon title today is Don't Forget the Benefits, all right? So this Thursday, obviously, is Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is many people's favorite holiday. How many people here is it your favorite holiday, right? Yeah. See, it's favorite holiday because it has a bonus, okay? You get to eat really good food with family, and you don't have to buy gifts. That's the cool thing about it, right? So we enjoy Thanksgiving. But Thanksgiving in the United States, just like Easter, just like Christmas, it's taken on its own identity that isn't necessarily anything to do with God, okay? Just as the Easter bunny is thought of more on Easter than Jesus, which is probably true, and as Santa Claus is thought of more often than Jesus on Christmas, so too is turkey and stuffing thought about a lot more on Thanksgiving than giving God thanks, don't you think? Isn't that the thing you picture? And you might even, as I was a kid, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you were kids at some point, right? As I was a kid, uh, they used to make lots of, we, they had us do lots of crafts with construction paper. I don't know if they do that anymore, okay? But we used to make lots of things out of construction paper. And I remember during Thanksgiving, we'd make those pilgrim hats with a big buckle on them and the buckles shoes out of construction paper. And then turkeys, turkeys with all those different colored. Did you ever do that? Anybody ever do that? Yeah, okay. Well, the old guys are as old as me did that. So that's awesome. Anyway, Thanksgiving is for the Christian, not supposed to be a once a year event. It's supposed to be a daily way of life. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. The Bible tells us that we should give thanks at all time in all circumstances. Okay? How many of us have reached that goal? There's one. Very good. God bless you. I haven't achieved that yet, but I'm working on that. So serving God means that there will be some things in your life that you will have to sacrifice, that you will have to forfeit so that you're able to follow Jesus fully. You know, we can't just be led by the flesh because the Bible says that those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. And the flesh has all kinds of desires, but not all all of those things are good to follow because if you lead or led by the flesh, the Bible says it ends up in death. So we want to end up in life We have to follow the Spirit. That means there are some things you're going to have to sacrifice, and the sacrifice doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. You know, it's kind of like you have to sacrifice, you know, taking drugs. Well, that's that's a good thing to sacrifice, okay? You have to sacrifice getting high. You have to sacrifice um, cheating on your spouse. Well, that's a good thing to sacrifice. It's not necessarily a bad thing to sacrifice. It's just that we cannot do everything that the flesh would lead us to do. We have to be led by the Spirit of God. So there's certain things that you're going to have to say no to. You're just going to have to say no to those things. But know this, the sacrifices that we make will not compare to the benefits that will be reaped by serving God with our whole heart. Whatever you have to sacrifice in this life is a small thing compared to the benefits that the Lord provides for us benefits that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about benefits. One of the difficult aspects, if you own your own business, is that you have to provide for your family certain benefits that would cost a lot of money for you that otherwise would have been free for you or at low cost to you if you had worked for someone else. But if you have your own business, that's one of those things you have to do. You have to pay for your own benefits. So when you have a job, salary isn't the only important part of that job, okay? Because there are benefits to be considered also. There are some jobs that the salary may not even be the highest in its category, but the benefits may be so great that it's worth it. Now, I've never worked at any place like these modern day, you know, like Facebook or Google. My my niece worked at Facebook, and... They had every day, like, a a giant restaurant, cafeteria. You could have all the food, anything you wanted, order it all. It was all free. It was on site. You could eat it right there. That's a benefit. You didn't have to go out to lunch. It was all right there. They'd cook it to order. You know, they had free transportation to get to work, free parking spaces if you drove, all this stuff that's a benefit, okay? So you have to consider the benefits because benefits are important. Now, my wife has worked in law for a long time, okay? And most of that has been in offices. And some of those offices have been far from home. 
My wife's present job does not pay as much as her previous job, but that's when we need to consider the benefits. My wife used to spend two hours a day commuting, an hour two and an hour back, without pay. You don't get paid for the commute, right? Now, that's 10 hours a week. And think about it, that's 40 hours a month. That's a whole week's worth of work, just transportation, just getting to work. 40 hours that she had to spend driving. Not only that, she had to pay for the gas to do it. She had to pay for the maintenance on the car. She had to pay for a toll to drive in a special lane so she could actually get to work. So she paid for the gas. She paid for the tolls. She paid for the maintenance. And she worked for 40 hours every month for nothing. Well, now things are different. She gets paid a little bit less, but she gets to stay home. She doesn't have to do the commute. She saves 40 hours a month from dr uh, of driving. She doesn't have to be out at night in those rainy, cold, dark winter nights where the rain's pelting on your windshield. You can barely see anything but the reflection of lights on your windshield stuck in a traffic jam that may take her an extra hour to get home. She doesn't have to do that anymore. Is that a benefit? Would you, would you be okay getting paid just a little bit less to be able to stay home? Man, that's a good benefit. Well, that's what she has now. And that's a good benefit. You know, that's worth a lot more than the other job she got paid for a little bit more. This is just way offsets it. What a benefit. The benefit is priceless. You may not make the top pay at your current job, but before you decide to jump ship, consider not just the pay, but the benefits, because the benefits count. A pension is a benefit. My last job, I had a little pension. It was a benefit. Medical, dental, vision, they're benefits. If you don't have a job that pays for those, you have to pay for those, and those are very expensive. Parking space, bus pass, flex time, those are all benefits. All of those things, if added together, can be worth tens of thousands of dollars a year if you had to pay for them out of your pocket. So don't forget your benefits. Now let's look at Psalms 103, 1 through 5. We're going to talk about benefits. Psalms 103, 1 through 5. I know David wrote it because it says it's a psalm of David. Okay? So it starts out this way. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Did you hear that? Don't forget all his benefits. It's easy to forget his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with loving devotion and compassion, who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Being thankful is something we are commanded to do. But this is more difficult when we forget all of our benefits. It is easier to be thankful when you remind yourself of the benefits. We have a lot of benefits. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 18 says, Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in every circumstance. For this is the will of, for you in Christ Jesus. The will of God for you in Christ Jesus. God's will is that we give thanks in all circumstances. That's his will. You want to know what God's will is? It's that we give thanks in all circumstances. So how do we accomplish that? How do we get ourselves to a place to where we can be thankful even though we find ourselves in unpleasant circumstances? Because sometimes you find yourself in unpleasant circumstances. I guess the only way you can become a person that is thankful while you're going through unpleasant circumstances is to remind yourself of the blessings in your life. To remind yourself of the good things in your life, to remind yourself on the things that God has provided for you. But if we're not careful, we will focus on the problems in our life instead of having a thankful heart. And that's one of our main problems. Now, it's easy to do because it's what the world does naturally. And if you're surrounded by, you know, 90% of the people around you aren't Christians, then 90% of those people are going to be complaining about what they're going through in life, and it just seems to you like that's normal. But we have to be the ones that say we don't focus 
on the things that are problems. We focus on the benefits, the circumstances that God has put us in, that we have been given by God so many blessings, so many benefits, so many good things in life, that we can focus on those and not on all the negative. It's really amazing how many things in this world, even as Americans, that we have come to take for granted. And on those rare occasions where those things are taken away, we realize how much we appreciate those things. Things like electricity. You know, if I'm out of electricity for 24 hours, you know, I'm really, I'm getting upset. I remember one year, people who lived in Woodenville, they were out of, they didn't have power for over a week. I couldn't imagine. I said, I couldn't imagine, yet I've been to Mexico in cities, if you want to call them that, that didn't have electricity all year, just didn't have it, didn't have water that ran, didn't have a toilet. Well, I have water. Do I appreciate it? No, I just don't even think about it. I have electricity. Do I appreciate it? I don't even think about it until it's gone, Right? Things we've gotten used to, we don't pay much attention to those because they've always been there. In fact, there was a time in history where food was something that was like a problem. What are we going to do? It's wintertime. The crops aren't growing in the winter. What do we do for food? There were times where people had to pray for their meal. Lord, we're going to go out and hunt, and we pray you get us something. We pray you show us the, the right place to go, the right place to fish, the right, you know, deer to go after, whatever it is so that we can provide for our family, because if not, we're going to starve to death. Food was a big issue at one time. It's not such an issue anymore. When was the last time you prayed for God to supply you with food? Think about it. I never do that. I thank God for the food, but I don't say, Lord, please tonight supply us with dinner. Do you ever do that? We take that for granted. That's a benefit that we live in a place where food is in such abundance and we have preservation methods that are so good that we can have food year round and there's never a shortage. You know, even in this modern world, there are places where there is shortages of food. There are places where people are starving to death. But we take that for granted, don't we? Children of Israel had to travel through a desert for 40 years. Deserts are not places of abundance. Do you realize that? A desert. Think of that. Have you ever been to the desert? I've been to the desert. And you look around, there's not a lot. It's usually pretty arid, pretty flat, and you see a few scrubs, a few brushes, maybe a cactus, and you might see life as in a lizard, perhaps, if you're lucky, But you don't see a whole lot of animals grazing. You don't see a whole lot of trees with fruit on them. You don't see any of that. It's a desert. So the children of Israel are going through a desert for 40 years. You know, you're going to need a lot of food in a desert. And you're going to need a lot of food for 40 years. Deserts are not places of abundance. So Moses led about 6 million Jews through a desert for 40 years. What kind of supplies do you think they would need to support their lives? Six million people in a desert for 40? What kind of, how much do you suppose they would need per day? Do you suppose if every little kid got out and chased lizards, they'd have enough to feed six million people? Do you think? Well, here's what it would take, just so you know. It'd take about 1,500 tons of food per day tons, 1,500 tons, 1,500 tons in a desert. 1,500 tons? How do you get 1,500 tons in a desert? How would you do that? How about this? 4,000 tons of wood per day to cook food. 4,000 tons of wood. It's not a forest. It's a desert. Where would you get that kind of wood? How about this? 11 million gallons of water per day to support 6 million people. 11 million gallons of water in a desert. You know, by definition, deserts don't have a lot of water. Where are you going to find that in a desert? And those are just the needs you can think of, but there's other needs too. 
How are you going to have enough porta potties for six million people in the desert? I mean, that creates an issue, doesn't it? There's a health issue there. You know, the Bible even addresses that. There's a health issue. It even addresses that. Deuteronomy 23, 12 through 13. You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall go out to it, and you shall have a stick with your weapons. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up your excrement. Okay. So even that necessity was provided for. God says, okay, I've got a plan for this. You just go out there and you do your thing and you dig a hole and you bury it and I'll supply you with 11 million gallons of water. I'll supply you with 1,500 tons of food and I'll supply you with 4,000 tons of firewood. Okay? What a deal. Can you imagine? Yeah, where do you get the sticks? <laughs> so what about the water? Let's talk about the water. That's a lot of water, isn't it? You know, that's a lot of water, even if you had uh, a reservoir, that's a lot of water per day, isn't it? Well, I'm going to read Numbers 20, verses 2 through 11. It says this. Now, there was no water for the congregation. Well, there you go. You see, it really was a desert. There was no water for the congregation. So they gathered against Moses and Aaron. They're going to blame these two guys. The people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished with our brothers before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Why have you led us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It is not a place of grain. There's no crops there. Or figs or vines or pomegranates. And there is no water to drink. No water. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. They fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. So they went from the presence of the congregation to the presence of God, because the presence of the people was just too much. They needed God's presence. And the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff and assemble the congregation. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch, and it will pour out its water. You will bring out water from the rock and provide drink for the congregation and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had been commanded. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen now, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff, so that a great amount of water gushed out, and the congregation and their livestock were able to drink. Okay. There was no water in the desert, but God provided a rock, a rock, okay? So he didn't provide, you know, something moist. It was a rock. I mean, how much water can be in a rock? But at least 11 million gallons a day flowed out of a rock. What about food? You got to have food. They already said there's no grain, there's no figs, there's no vines, there's no pomegranates. What about food? Well, God supplied food for everybody. That was a great miracle also. They were in a desert, but they didn't lack any food. That sounds like a reason to give the Lord thanks, don't you think? God supplied the water. Oh, praise God, we're saved. God supplied the food. When we have something provided for us for a long time, we tend to take it for granted. We forget what a blessing it is to have it because we've gotten so used to it. And what happens when you take a blessing for granted? You know what? Even though you still have the blessing, the water's still there, the food's still there, when you take it for granted, you begin to complain. You've even got the water and you're complaining. If you didn't have the water, you'd be going, oh, thank God for water, just like when we're out without electricity for 24 hours and it comes back on. Oh, thank God for electricity. We stop giving thanks and we grumble when we get too used to the blessings. So here's what Numbers 11, 1 through 6 talks about. It talks about the food. Soon the people began to complain about their hardship in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was kindled, and a fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. And the people cried out to Moses, and he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down so that the place was called Taborah because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Meanwhile, the rabble among them had a strong craving for other food because God had given them manna. And again, the Israelites wept and said, who will feed us meat 
We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt, along with the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlics and beatings. Oh, we'll just forget about that part. But now our appetite is gone, and we see nothing but manna. We're so tired of manna, 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 everyday manna. How about everyday nothing? Try that, and then manna suddenly sounds really good, doesn't it? How about we turn off the manna? Oh, Lord, please give us manna back. No, you got so much manna, you go, manna, shmanna, who needs manna? When they were afraid, they would starve to death. Manna was a welcome sight, but in time, they lost their thankfulness for manna. <laughs> Just manna. <laughs> Who needs manna? But they had an abundance of it. They became ungrateful for God's provision, and then they began to complain. And that's what happens sometimes. When we get too used to what we have, we start to complain. You know, you've got a car that works, and you complain that it's not the newest car, right? Okay. So... Complaining, just so you know, is like praise in the ears of the enemy. The enemy goes, oh, that's music to my ears, complaining, whining, complain. oh, pray, do it some more, do it some more. I love to hear that. Complaint is a song sung by the unthankful. God dwells in the praises of his people, but when complaining enters the scene, the enemy gets in the middle. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 through 10 talks about these folks that complained during the time in the wilderness. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not complain as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Now these things happen to them. Say, thank God we live in the New Testament. It says this, and these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Lord's saying, yeah, that happened in the Old Testament time. He says, but that's a warning for you guys too. Don't complain. Don't complain because when you complain, you invite the enemy in. And it says they were destroyed of the destroyer because of their complaining. You invite the enemy in. It's not that God punishes you. It's that the enemy is allowed an open door into your life when you complain. It's praises to him. He is drawn to it. He loves to hear you complain. The wages or benefits of giving thanks are God's presence and God's provision. Think about that benefit. The wages of unthankfulness and complaining are the presence of the enemy and lack. Think about that when you complain. That's the wages of that. Which do you want? God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. So in regards to living a life that pleases the Lord and brings his blessing... What do we need to focus on? Well, we're going to look once again at Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that you are, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, it says here, forget not all his benefits. So the question would be, what exactly are those benefits so that we can remember them? This psalm is in no way an exhaustive list of God's benefits. It's just a little tip of the iceberg. But in it, David mentions several benefits that he extends to his people. So what benefits did this psalm talk about? Psalms 103, verse 3. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Okay. Well, number one, God forgives all your sins. Don't forget that. That's a benefit. We forget this benefit sometimes because we look at that as uh, something that happened way in the past when we first got saved. When we first saved, we were so messed up and we were unforgiving because we hadn't yet given our lives to Christ. We hadn't repented. And so we repented and God said, I forgive you for everything. We go, oh, thank God that happened way back then. But you've forgotten something. Not only did he forgive all your sins, but he still forgives your sins every day. He still is forgiving. Don't forget the benefit. The benefit isn't just that he forgave you in the beginning. He's still forgiving you. Every day when you mess up, he's still willing to forgive. We need to be thankful that he still forgives because what if he just forgave the once? What if he said, I'm going to wipe your record clean? All you got to do now is keep it clean. 
oh man, that would have been of no value to us unless we died this instant after we got saved, right? But don't forget the benefit. You see, what if you had a new car and you drove it out of the car a lot and crashed it? Well, suddenly your new car no longer looks like a new car. There's a remedy. You take it to the body shop, and a few days later, your car looks new again. It doesn't have a scratch. But then you have to go back out on the street again. You have to be in a parking lot where people run shopping carts into it and open doors onto it. And you can say, I've got to try to keep it just like it is when it's brand new. But you know what? Stuff happens, doesn't it? Well, thankfully, even though we still go out there in the world and we still get banged up and we still get bruised and we still get dirtied up, thank God every day he restores us to new. Every day he forgives our sins. If we confess our faults before him, he's just and faithful to forgive us for our faults and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You get a new car every day, so to speak. You, a new you, every day. Every scratch gets removed every day as long as you pay attention to the fact that he forgives those that confess to him. That's a benefit, isn't it? That's a good benefit. It would have been a benefit to forgive me once, but he keeps forgiving me. That's a good benefit, okay? So we're careful now. Maybe we get less stings and scratches, but you know, you still need that benefit, don't you? My life was a wreck, and Jesus did a complete restoration, and he gave me a new start. But then I had to go back in the world, didn't you? You know, out there to work and everything, and you're amongst people rubbing elbows. And scratches and dings tend to happen here and there. And I blow it sometimes, and I try to live sin-free, but sometimes I mess up, don't you? But thank God for the benefit that he forgives all of our sins. Thank you. Here's what we do, 1 John 1, 8 through 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, does that mean we can just mess up and be forgiven and like brand new? Yeah, <laughs> but don't abuse that. Don't say, therefore, I can just go out and mess up and I'll be fine. We don't presumptuously sin, but accidents happen, don't they? Unplanned things happen, and that is there for us for our protection so that we can always walk in, in perfect righteousness with God. Is there a limit to how many times he forgives us? Well, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Because of the loving devotion of the Lord, we are not consumed. For his mercies never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I'm thankful that his mercies are new every morning. Aren't you? How often can we receive his mercies every morning? They're new. We should be thankful for that, shouldn't we? Can you imagine how deeply impacted David was by God's forgiveness? You know the things David did in his life. We can see that thankfulness in some of his psalms. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God, but his benefit is there for us when we make mistakes. The benefit of forgiveness is a comfort to us. It demonstrates God's radical love for us and sacrifice on our behalf. Can you give God thanks simply because he's a forgiving God? Is that something you can remind yourself of every day? What is the next benefit mentioned in this Psalm 103? says, who heals all our diseases. Do you know God still heals? He desires to see his children healed physically, spiritually, emotionally. We can experience healing in this lifetime right now, but God has also promised us perfect eternal health in the life to come. What a benefit. That's a benefit. You know, the sinners don't get these benefits. They've got a plan, and there's wages, but they don't get this benefit. We have great benefits. And what's the next benefit? Who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. God redeems our life from certain destruction. He redeems our life from the direction we were going that was ending up in the pit, that was ending up in a place of total destruction, of total loss. We are born in sin, and sin separated us from God. But to remove that sin, a price had to be paid. That's what redemption is all about. He redeems our life from the pit. Redemption is all about paying a price that was owed. Redemption is a transaction where we're bought back from the slavery we've been living in. 
Redemption in the Bible points to the salvation provided for someone through a relationship with a person called a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman redeemer is a relative that steps in to buy you back from your slave master and restore you to your proper place in the family. And that's what Jesus is, our kinsman redeemer. He redeems your life from the pit. Oh, thank God he's redeemed us. You know what? That's a good thing that he did, but you can still be thankful for it today. Still be thankful because you still have that. You have redemption. The price in our case to redeem us back could only come from one person, Jesus Christ. It's the precious blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You can be thankful for that today. Everyone who's ever been born into this world must face death as a result of Adam's sin. But for the believer, death is not permanent. Why not? Because God sent his son to pay the debt for sin and death. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we believers are spared eternal destruction. We've been made alive in the spirit so that we can never die. And I'm speaking spiritually, of course. Because we all know this mortal body eventually will die. But you know what? Even that is not permanent because we will be resurrected. We will rise again and have a new body that never, ever dies, and that's a benefit. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep or die, but we will all be changed in an instant in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for the perishable must be clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality... When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? What's the next benefit mentioned in Psalms 103? It's verse 4. It's the second part that after it says, who redeems your life from the pit, it says, crowns you with loving devotion and compassion. We are crowned with God's love and compassion. Kings wear crowns, slaves do not wear crowns. The crown sits upon the head. The crown sits upon our head to give us the mind of Christ. We see ourselves in a whole new perspective. We think in a whole new way because we have been given the mind of Christ. We have a mind that is influenced by the Holy Spirit. With this mind, two things we can do. We can see things through God's eyes, and we can understand how God sees us. And God wants us to know his mind, the mind of Christ. He wants us to know that he's crowned us with his loving kindness and with his devotion. He wants us to know that no matter how much you've messed up, no matter how much you hate yourself, no matter how much you look in the mirror and don't like what you see, he says, I love you, and I always will. No matter how how worthless you see yourself. He says, I see you as priceless, and I paid a priceless price, the blood of Christ, because I love you. You say, but I'm not worthy of it. Yes, we know. That's not the point. You're worth it to him. That's the point. We're not slaves any longer. We've been crowned with his loving kindness. We've been crowned also with the ability to see others as he sees them. And therefore, we can show others the loving devotion that God has towards them too. You know, many people are drawn to Christ just simply because they will see Christ in you. They will see the love of God expressed through you to them. They'll say, why would you be so kind to me because of Christ in me? The hope of glory, right? When they encounter you, they get a taste of Jesus. God's loving compassion towards us protects us. It intervenes in our lives in ways that we often don't even know about. You'd be surprised how many things happen to us, actually, that don't happen to us because of Christ's intervention. You'd be surprised how many things we didn't experience that we would have experienced if we weren't in Christ. Psalms 139, 16 through 18, your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written in your book and ordained for me before one of them came to be. 
How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is their sum. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awake, I'm still with you. In his great compassion, he spares us from many evils and many tragedies. How many times, this is a rhetorical question because you can't answer it. How many times has the Lord saved you from an evil or a tragedy? How many times? You know what? You can't know. You can't know because some of these things you've never experienced because he protected you from them. Those things that were coming down the path towards you, he blocked them before you ever noticed them, before you ever saw them. He put your enemies to death or in chains before they ever got to you. How many are his thoughts towards us? We can't even number them. We can't even imagine them. They're like the sands of the sea. They're innumerable. He's on duty 24-7. He's watching over us. I can't tell you how many times he's watched over me. I should be dead so many times over, but I'm not dead because he decided I shouldn't be dead, right? I, I could give you so many testimonies. I'll just give you one. It's a very simple one, very simple one, because I was angry at the time, okay? So I'm driving my car, and I had this car, this, uh, this, this car that in those days, they had a rear window thing that was kind of triangular, and it, it just kind of popped out like this and this and this, you know, but it didn't roll down. It was just had a little latch, you know. So I had it latched, and I'm driving, and all of a sudden, pop! I turn around in that window. The latch is just busted in half, and it's swinging out there. And I'm going, oh, you know, Jesus, what's going on? Like, what a pain. How, like, what just happened? This is ridiculous. As this window swings out, I put the brakes on the car. I pull over. And the second I pull over, there's a green light. The second I pull over, a car runs through the intersection, would have totally plowed into me full speed and wiped me out. And, but I had to stop because of that window, that inconvenience. And I realized, whoa, I was on my way there, I stopped within a second before it happened. That's happened lots of times. But how many times I didn't know? Because I got stuck in some traffic and was complaining and didn't realize he kept me from this huge accident that I was going to, you know, I was going to intersect with. But God knew. How many times? How many times did you avoid falling off a cliff when you were looking over the edge and didn't even realize that he just like kept you up there? How many times do you save your life so far? How many times do you think he saved your life so far? Probably every day. You just don't know it. That's because he loves you. He never sleeps. His eyes are always open. He's even numbered the hairs on your head. And if one goes missing, he knows about it. Right? He goes, oh, man, number 64 is gone. Forever. Luke 12, 6 through 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God, and even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than a lot of sparrows, right? We're going to be okay because he's got, he's got our back, doesn't he? Don't forget that benefit that he's watching over you. Don't forget the benefit that he's protecting you. Don't forget the benefit that he redeems your life from destruction. Don't forget the benefit that he protects you in everything that you do and everywhere that you go. Don't forget the benefit that he provides for all of your needs no matter what. Don't forget that. What's the next benefit spoken in Psalms 103? Who satisfies you with good so that your new youth is renewed like the eagles. He satisfies you with good. Hmm. What's your favorite food? Is it tacos? That's one of mine. Well, let's just suppose one day you were hungry and the Lord knew what would satisfy you, a good thing. So out of the heavens floated down a taco into your hand. In that case, he would be satisfying you with something good. Now see, if... For me, for me, if oysters came down in my hand, I go, no, don't like them, don't like the taste, get at it. That wouldn't be a good thing. But tacos, that would be a good thing. He knows how to satisfy me with good things, right? So he knows what's good to you and what's good for you, and he knows how to satisfy you with that, not something that's second rate. So could you say that the Lord satisfied you with a taco if that happened to you? Well, not so fast. The answer isn't necessarily yes, before, because before he can satisfy you with the taco, it isn't just in the giving of the taco, it's that you have to actually consume the taco. In your hand, it's not fully satisfying. It has to be in your belly to be fully satisfying. Isn't that right? Okay, so what's that all about? Well, God satisfies you with good things. Now, every day, God gives you good things, but that isn't what satisfies. What satisfies you is the taking in of the good things. He actually doesn't just give you the food, but the power to eat it. He doesn't just actually get to give you the experience, 
but he gives you the power to experience it. He gives you the ability not just to see it, but to participate in it. Every day he satisfies you with good things. The fact that you woke up and you weren't in a hospital, that's a good day. The fact that you could get up and, and drink that cup of coffee, that's a good thing, because some people can't drink anything because they got tubes inside them. You know, they're, 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 they're in a coma. They got to be fed with other tubes. Uh, what about the fact that, you know, you got to, had to go to work? You know, thank God you have a job. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You don't know my, about my job, though. Well, yeah, I know, but it could be a lot worse because God's with you, and God's going to bless you. And you got to remember all the benefits that God has brought into your life. So he satisfies us with good things. In other words, they could be present all around us, good things, but if we can't partake of them, they don't satisfy. But he allows us to be satisfied. That's why we need to not forget all his benefits. What happens when we forget his benefits? When we forget, we become unthankful. And that's the big problem today. It says, in the last time, perilous times shall come. 2 Timothy 3. Last time, perilous times shall come come. Men shall be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. And one of the things is unthankful, unholy, unthankful, unthankful, unthankful. A lot of people, kids, have every toy you could imagine, and they're unthankful. When I was a kid, I had no toys, you know? I mean, a few toys, hand-me-down toys, but I was thankful for what I had because at least I could play with that one toy. But now they can have everything they want, and they're not thankful. Sometimes that happens when we have an abundance. We have so much, we just get glutted. We just like it's like if you ate all the food you could possibly eat, the best food there is, and now you're not hungry anymore, right? So people have become unthankful, and what happens when you become unthankful? Even though you have provision, you have all these things to enjoy, you begin to complain even though you've got everything because you're not satisfied. When you complain, you invite the enemy's participation in your life because murmuring and complaining are like praises to his ears. When we recognize, acknowledge, and remember God's benefits, we become thankful. And this brings the presence of God because God puts his presence, he brings his presence into the praises of his people. He presents himself in the praises of his people. So I'm going to walk in his favor, don't you? Psalms 5.12, for surely you, O Lord, bless the righteous. You surround them with the shield of your favor. He surrounds you with the shield of his favor. Who? The righteous, who are they? They're the ones who serve the Lord with their whole heart. They're the ones who give thanks in all circumstances. They're the ones who acknowledge him in all their ways and he directs their paths. They're the ones who give uh, glory to his name for all the things that he has done. And what's the last thing that's mentioned in Psalms 103? It says, who satisfies with good things. It says, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He renews your youth. What does that mean? It means he refreshes us. He restores us. He renews us so that we don't have to feel burned out, washed out, worn out. God's presence will restore you. God's presence will refresh you, make you feel like new again. Have you ever been in a situation, maybe it was in a service, maybe it was just listening to a worship song, whatever, to where you just felt God's presence come on you so heavily, it's kind of like, well, I feel like I just got born again, you know? It's like a refreshing it's like I feel new again. I feel like, wow, I've just, it's like, like the first time that I met the Lord. It's he's renewing you by his spirit. He renews your youth like the eagles. Now, you know what they say about eagles? Eagles molt every year, so they lose their feathers, and they get new feathers. And because they get new feathers every year, their feathers are never more than a year old. So when you look at an eagle, you can't tell their age at all. You just can't tell it. You can look at them. You cannot, they all look the same, you know? So an old eagle looks like a young eagle. They all got the same. Forget not all his benefits, or we could say something else. Forget not. That's one of those negative things, like don't do it, don't do it. Well, let's give it the positive thing, the do. How about this? Remember all his benefits. Remember them every day. Remind yourself of his benefits every day. If you remind yourself constantly of his benefits, there's no room for complaining. There is lots of room for praising. And when there is praising, it brings the presence of God into your situation. And when there is praising, when the presence of God comes into your situation, it is the thing that will turn your situation around for good. Okay? Because all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. And if you're loving Him, praising Him, worshiping Him, He'll turn everything for good. But if you're complaining and murmuring, 
we found, it says, you know, this was a sample in the Old Testament. It says, it's, a, it's an example for you to understand. When they complained, they were destroyed because it invited the presence of the destroyer. Well, we don't want to do that, do we? So let's be thankful. On this Thursday, give thanks and remember all of his benefits. And then make it a practice every day, no matter how humdrum it is, no matter how just like yesterday it was to say, you know what, I'm really fortunate because again today he's restored my youth like the eagle. Again today he's redeemed my life from the pit. Again today he supplied all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Again today he's forgiven all of my sins. You know, again today. They're new every morning. The mercies are new every morning. Amen. All righty. So I want to ask this. Is there anybody here who has not given your heart to Jesus? You've never asked him to come into your life and save you. If you have not, then, okay, this church preaches the truth. There really is a hell. There really is a heaven. Okay? Salvation is through Jesus only. And everybody who's born is destined for an eternity without God. But God has provided his son's sacrifice so that everybody could be brought to him, so that everybody could spend eternity with him in heaven, so that you don't have to perish, but you can have eternal life. God supplied that because he loves you. He loves the lost, he loves the saved, and he provided the price that needed to be paid for all of us. Everybody's invited. Is there anybody here who needs to receive the Lord today? Anybody? Raise your hand if you do. You want to ask him into your life? Become a new creation.